an amazing God, is he not? Hasn't God been faithful? Hasn't he been good? Hasn't he been kind? I dare you, just look around. I guarantee you, you're, you're in the proximity of a miracle. We can see God's miraculous and keeping power somewhere up and down your road. Come on, let's just take this next 30 seconds and Three, set four. this atmosphere ablaze. Just four. Somebody erupt with praise even now. Come on, open up your mouth, hey. Zion. Clap your hands, hey. all ye people. And let's shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people. And let's shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Come on, lift your voices high. Clap your hands, all ye people. And let's shout unto God with the voice of triumph. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, he is. Great Jehovah God, he is. Jehovah Jireh, he is. Healer, he is. Provider, he is. Protector, he is. Faithful, he is. Hallelujah. Jesus, we come to honor you. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. We invite you down here to this altar as we go forth in worship. The only requirement that we have of today's service is that you have a spirit of expectation. Everybody shout, expectation. Hallelujah. Father, we've come into your house. We've come into your presence. And we've come seeking your face. We've come seeking your presence, Lord Jesus. You've gathered us from far and near, from all around the world, through the technology of the internet, oh God. We've come to this one place, the potter's house, to see what you're going to do on today. Hallelujah. And we've come with the spirit of expectation, oh God. We understand that you've got the power if we've got the faith. Hallelujah. You've got the power if we have the faith to believe, oh God. Father, we thank you, oh God, that you're going to meet us in this place and in this service. So right now, we commit it to you. Hallelujah. We commit this time to you. Father, have your way in the name of the Lord Jesus. Move from heart to heart and from breast to breast, oh God. Let your spirit move in this place and in this place, oh God. I thank you, oh God. That as we've come to seek you, oh God, you shall be found. As we've come to knock, oh God, the door shall be open before we leave this place. Thank you, oh God, that healing is going to be our portion today. I thank you that somebody's heart is going to be mended today. In this service, I thank you, oh God. Even the more, oh God, for the soul that shall come to know you in the pardon of their sins. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We lift you. We bless you. We esteem you high. Hallelujah. And Father, it's not lost on us. The many calamities that are happening around this world. But I thank you, O oh God, that your name is a strong tower. And the righteous, O oh God, can run therein and be saved. So, Father, we lift up the name of Jesus as a banner. Huh? Come on, raise it with your praise, Diana. We lift the name of Jesus as a banner high. We raise the name of Jesus as a banner high. We lift high the name of Jesus. Jesus is exalted. Jesus is exalted. Jesus is lifted. Jesus reigns forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We commit this service again to you. Have your way in Jesus' name. And we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Come on, somebody Lord, start doing it now. We'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's have the church. We've come and we set our focus upon you, Jesus. We just want you. Come on. Put those hands together, church, as we go forth and worship. So God.
those who were gathered in the upper room. They were in one place, and here's the key, in one accord, with one mind and one soul. The sound of pursuit fill this room. I got good news, church. He can't resist the invitation of his people. As we cry out to him, he's going to respond. He's going to respond. Let the sound of pursuit fill this room again. Come on. Voices lifted all over this room. affections and our attentions on you, O oh God. As everything buys and competes for our attention, O oh God, we set it solely on you. We turn our eyes upon Jesus today. We look full in his wonderful face. We thank you, O oh God, that we know who you are. <laughs> Hallelujah. We know who you are. know you as healer. We've come to know you as healer. We 
know you as our friend. And before the foundations of the world, you were God. And long after the world ends, you'll still be God. Hands lifted all over this room. Thank you for your manifest presence in this house.
contradictory but in spite of what you see with your eye the Bible said shout unto God with the voice of triumph you might be watching online but shout unto God with the voice of triumph your neighbors gonna think you're crazy but shout unto God with the voice of triumph the next apartment might complain but shout unto God you know, 
Ooh, you may be seated in his illustrious presence. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you with Jesus. Joy, I'm delighted to see you here this morning in the house of the Lord. You act like you came for business this morning. Somebody really came to praise the Lord. You didn't come to look around and be seen. You came to praise the name of the Lord. You had to get a witness in here. And I feel glory. Yes, sir. I feel glory in the room. I feel glory in the room from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I feel glory in the room. Tell your neighbor, I feel glory in the room. I feel glory in the room. From the top of my head, down up to the bottom. On the one, here we go. I feel glory. Two. Three. I feel glory. One more. I feel glory. Two. Sit down, because you're going to make me. You're going to make me.
sing that for about 30 minutes. Glory, 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 glory. That one song over there, it's in the road. Glory, glory, it's glory, the glory, road. glory, 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 glory. All of a sudden, somebody gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Glory, it's glory, 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 glory. It's in the road. It's in the road. And will start shrinking. It's in the road. It's in the road. It's in the road. Suicide! Would I have to get out of here? Because he's in the room. He's in the room. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, my. Hey, 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 hey! From the top of my head! From the top of my head! Yeah! 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 Glory, 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 glory. That's what they were singing when I came through. They were singing like that when I got the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir, OG. Yes, boys and tambourines, and bass drums, and girl mothers dressed in white. From the top of my head! Oh! Another mother, hold on. Down upon the top of my The biggest was that I feel glory. I feel glory. In the Y'all, we got to act right. We, got, we just getting started. We got a long way to go. Mm-hmm. Everybody got to be quiet. Can't nobody say that because we sitting on dynamite right now. One more hallelujah. I don't know what will happen to I have to thank the Lord, everybody. May I take just a moment and selfishly and yet appropriately honor the Lord for our First Lady being back in the service of the Lord. I believe I'm coming this morning. Hallelujah. Fighting back, watching the enemy be defeated in the service of the Lord. Can you shout amen, somebody? And someone else who's been out a long time that I can see is back in the service of the Lord. Been in this church probably long as I as I have. Deacon Snyder, would you stand? We're so glad to see you. We're so glad to see you back in the service of the Lord. God is so good. God is so good. Come on, clap your hands and thank God for him. He's been in a fight, but he made it. Been in a fight, but he made it. Because there's glory in the room. Say amen, somebody. Got several guests I want to acknowledge visiting us this morning. Dr. Kevin James, president of Moore. Morris Brown College in Atlanta, Georgia. Would you stand, sir? Welcome to the Potter's House. Welcome to the Potter's House. Come on, you can make him feel welcome. Give him a Texas welcome. Yeah, give him a good Texas welcome. Also joining us, not a stranger to us, but with us this morning, Mother Linda Griffin from the Mother's Board and granddaughter Hunter Griffin, guest at Hey You Friday. Would you stand? Come on, thank God. We're glad to see her in the service of the Lord. And can you say amen? So many great things are going on. We got 28 people to be baptized today. If you're one of those 28, would you stand up right quick? We just want to thank God for you. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. 28 people going into the watery grave, rising up to walk in the newness of life. Can you say amen? Many of you may not know the lady that I'm about to mention, but she is a a bulwark in the church, been around a long, long, long time preaching and ministering the gospel. I've known her for many, many decades, and she's fighting for her life on life support, Dr. Wanda Davis Turner. Uh, yes, and I want you to just 
In fact, let's just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, go into that ICU unit and touch and heal and deliver uh, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for Dr. Wanda Davis Turner, her life, her ministry, her legacy, her years of service calling on your name. Uh, we ask you to raise her up, Lord. Uh, heal her for your glory. Touch her in the name of Jesus. If you do call her, call her without suffering. She's your child. In Jesus' name we pray. Give God praise right now. So much to be prayed about. So much going on in the world. All over the Middle East, there's prayer needed right now. Come on, talk to me, somebody. People are starving and suffering and destitute and homeless and on the run and afraid and grieving and in bereavement. Hallelujah, you can almost name any country. From Palestine to Israel, you can name any country from Ukraine to Russia. There's suffering going on every where glory to God people have lost their sons and their daughters and their big mamas and grandmamas and things like that that's painful as they go around picking up pieces and bags uh, that's trauma but we can pray that God can touch and heal and strengthen and deliver and I believe in for peace I said I believe in for peace I believe in for peace Hallelujah, I expect it in Jesus' name. So many things going on. Look at your neighbor and say, I got a lot going on. Yeah, I got a lot going on. Don't let the smile fool you. <laughs> I got a lot going on. Got a lot going on. To all of my leaders, CEOs, executives, pastors, pastors, associate pastors, team leaders, department heads, choir directors, music, worship departments, the International Leadership Conference is on its way. Do not miss it. March 21st through the 23rd is not far. In order to get the best price, you need to register right now. We're in the last few months of the year. There's no time like the present to reserve your seat for one of the most powerful conferences I don't know how God blessed me to get the lineup that I did, but he blessed me. He made some folks say yes that thought they was going to say no. But you know when God's got something for you, God will turn a no into a yes. Can I get a witness, somebody? We've got a great lineup of preachers, teachers, thinkers, leaders that will be able to speak into our lives. Pastor and civil rights activist A.R. Bernard, uh, entrepreneur, author, philanthropist, economist John Hope Bryant is going to be with us. Author, pastor, leadership, businessman Dale Brunner is going to be in the room. Come on. Woman Evolved Visionary, podcast host, New York Times best-selling author and pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts will be in the room. CEO, author, and pastor Keon Henderson will be in the room. And uh, I, uh, my, my longtime friend, preacher, devil chasing Noel Jones, gonna be in the room. There's an increase coming October 30th, so don't delay. Uh, save that money so you can go out to dinner by registering right now. October 30th is the deadline before there is a price increase. To all the associate pastors, would you stand? I just want to thank you and appreciate you and honor you for your service, for your commitment. Amen. For your longevity, some of you, your shortivity. We're glad to have you in the army of the Lord. Yeah, we got short ones and long ones and new ones and seasoned ones. Yes, I'm seasoned. I'm not old. I'm seasoned. I got oregano on me. We thank God for all of you being in the service of the Lord, your spouses, your families, the sacrifice you make. And by the way, while we're talking about Pat, how about that Wednesday school?
It has been so exciting. We're approaching the final week of our Wednesday school beta test. It's just a test to see if we could get it all worked out. So I want you to be sure and be here this Wednesday night. We're tightening it up. We're going to do it again. We're going to keep doing it. It's important. It's important. It's important. Amen. Pilot, many of you appreciate the small group settings and the opportunity to ask questions and dive deeper into dedicated topics, the life of Christ, worship, the Bible, and money, and others. Some have noted that the classes have jump-started important conversations in their homes and in their lives. Even the kids are excited about Wednesday school. Give God a praise. If you haven't attended on Wednesday night, make it your business to come out. It is an entirely different experience, and I believe there's going to be more to come. We are confident this format will cultivate a deeper thirst and hunger for spiritual knowledge like we've never seen before. For those who join us in person, we have a number of dining options, including our in-house eatery, Cafe 67777. That's us, y'all. And amen. And food trucks available to purchase from yep. before service beginning at 5 p.m. We don't do that to raise money. We do that for your comfortability. Some of you live too far away to have to go all the way back home and get something to eat and change clothes and get back in time. It's a convenience uh, so that you can come in your Burger King outfit and still receive the love of the Lord. Please join us again this week, either in person or online at the Potter's House dot org forward slash stream uh, amen so that you can better have an opportunity in fact you can attend up to three different courses even online and be a part of it and we're working every week to make it a smoother transition for you and for us uh, as we beta test this opportunity to use our facility to its fullest capacity and our team of leaders we got so many great teachers i went to every class i went to every there wasn't a class i went in i didn't want to stay i stood in the door in between two classes eavesdropping on both sides and then i had my youtube on in my hand and i was keeping up with everything at the same time and yeah i'm greedy i'm greedy i know y'all want to do it all no you can't stand in the door that's my privilege amen so be a part of that uh footnote that I forgot to miss if you register before October 31st before October 30th on ILS you will save 100 buckaroos 100 deceased presidents will stay in your pocket if you don't procrastinate it's expensive to be late say it again it's expensive to be late there's so many things that God has done for us and, and he's been doing it all the time. But when you watch the news and you begin to understand that any of these horror stories that we're seeing on the news could be us. Could be us. I was watching while I was getting dressed how they come into people's houses and, and tore into their safe room tried to break into their safe rooms, killing babies and children, old women snatched out of the house, destroyed. I don't care who you are, what you have, how many degrees you have, how much money you have, none of that would help you if that were to happen to us. There but for the grace of God go I. We have so much to be thankful for. The Bible said that when we give, when we sow, when we plant into the kingdom of God, he would stop our figs from casting their fruit before it's time that God would preserve you. How many of you feel preserved? Look at your neighbor and say, you don't even look like what you've been through. Don't even tell me your business because I wouldn't even believe it. You don't even look like you came from where you came from. You don't look like you had to endure what you had to endure. God must be on your side. God must be on your side. Hallelujah, honor him 
and appreciate him and most of all acknowledge him that word acknowledge is so important acknowledge him don't sit up here and think that it, those things can't happen to you acknowledge him in all thy ways and he should direct that path. You're watching online, you have an opportunity to acknowledge him in tithes and in offering. Right. I yeah. hope you were in the class uh, that Pastor Tudman was teaching about tithes and offerings on Wednesday night. Glory to God, it will bless your life. It will bless your life. I believe that a blessed 90 is better than a cursed 100. I said I believe that a blessed 90 is better than a cursed 100. I break the curse over my life every time I tithe. I prove to God that no matter how much he blesses me, I will not forget to say thank you. I said thank you when I had food stamps. I said thank you when I was on wick. I said thank you when I was eating powdered eggs. I said thank you when I was eating powdered milk. And now if you bless me, Lord, I will remember you. I won't get so high and so mighty that I think it's for other folks. I will remember you, lest you cut holes in my pocket and I have to go back again. I'm not as good at being broke as I was the first time. I was good at being broke. I knew right where to go to get retread tires, pad my couch on top of the car and broke it down, had my mama holding the other side of it. I was good at it. I'm not good at it now. I don't know where to get no retread tires. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I don't want I don't want him to cut holes in my pocket. I don't want him to cut holes in my pocket. And all my money go out to the hospital and to the doctor's office and to the mortician. I don't want him to cut holes in my pocket. Amen. I know I got some lawyers in here, but I don't want to give you my money. I don't want him to cut holes in my pocket. I don't want to be on no trial hat. I don't look good in orange. I wear a lot of colorful. I'd be a colorful guy. You ain't seen me in the orange suit up here. God did not intend for a brother to be wearing stripes. Number on his back. Mama gave me a name. Didn't give me no number. Shout somebody. So we remember him, not just in times of crisis, but now in the good times. We store up where the canker worms and the palmer worms cannot eat it, where the thief cannot rot. We store it up so that in the time of need, we can draw down what we need from God. Somebody offered to pay for something the other day. I said, no, 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 I'll pay for it. Let me do it while I can. Yeah, let me do it. So if the time ever comes that I have to draw on you, I won't have wore you out acting broke. You know, there's some folks that act broke. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. It's a difference between being down and being broke. I'm not broke. My spirit is not broken. My creativity is not broken. My mind is not broken. My wife might argue with that, but for the most part, my mind is not broken. Most of it works, say amen, somebody. It's offering time in the sanctuary. From the balcony to the front row to the pulpit to every area that's watching online, it is offering time in the sanctuary. This is as much a part of worship, if, if not more, than anything we do. This is what Abraham went up on the mountain for. This is what Noah, when he got, when he found out that he had survived what other people had drowned in, the first thing he did before he built a house was build an altar and make a sacrifice unto God. Because he knew he could have been underwater. Thank you, Jesus. Look at somebody and say, I'm not underwater. Oh yeah, I'm not underwater. My neck might be wet, but I'm not underwater. <laughs> I might have had a close call. Damn, I'm not underwater. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I will remember the Lord. I will remember the Lord in times and offerings. The information is on your screen, how you can give. You've got various ways that you can give on your phone. It's so convenient to give now. You can text to give. 
all the information is on the screen for you to give. We're going to give you an opportunity to get that ready while they sing. Then I'm going to come back and you and I are going to touch and agree. You and I are going to touch and agree that the blessing of the Lord will make rich and add no sorrow to it. That God will give us power to get wealth. You don't have to give me wealth. Give me power to get wealth. Give me power to get wealth. Somebody shout power. Glory to God. Power is influence. Power is opportunity. Power is talent. Power is favor. Somebody shout power. Yeah, God said I'm going to give you power to get wealth. I'm going to pray with you in just a moment. Bless them, children. Is there anybody who still loves the hymns of the church? If I get five or six people to stand up, we're going to sing this one together. of the fact you all for tuning in. it is not that we are asking for much and more
dead. We might not have what we want, but we got something in there. We're grateful to you for your goodness over our lives. We're not burning up with fever. We're not trembling with disease. We're not ice cold because of sickness. We are doing pretty good and we're grateful to you. I thank you, Lord, for the increase that's going to happen out of our attitude, out of our gratitude. You're going to graciously, exceedingly, and abundantly bless your people. Thank you for the power to get well. Thank you for making us ahead and not the tail. Thank you for giving us divine favor. Thank you for opening up doors that no man can close. Thank you that the property will sell. Thank you that we will succeed. Thank you that the loan will close. Thank you that the door will open. Thank you that we will get into school. Thank you that our tuition is paid. Thank you that the way is made. Thank you that the door is open. Thank you that our children are blessed. Thank you that our grandchildren are blessed. Thank you that our parents are blessed. Thank you that our grandparents are blessed. Thank you that my house didn't burn down. Thank you that I still got running water in life. Thank you for your many blessings you have given in our lives. Now be faithful. I don't know where he is. I'm going to In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody who believes that prayer, shout amen. Pass your seat to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left, till there's nobody left. I stayed around just in case. Yeah. And then the person all the way on the left is standing with everyone's seat in the hand. PMTs are in place and ready to receive the offering unto the Lord. Can you say amen? Serve the people of God. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You might still be there, Brother DeMarcus. Brother Dave Marcus. <laughs> we are going to the Gospel of St. John, chapter number 14, verse number 1. There you will find our assignment for this morning. It is not often that we go to John 14 without a casket in front of the building, but we're going there today because there's something that God wants us to learn out of the text. Uh, it is John 14. I wanted to read the whole verse, but I figured it might be too much for you. So I got 16 through 27 in the hopes that you might at your own leisure go through the whole context from which the text is extrapolated and thereby gain extra wisdom as to what Jesus is summarizing to his disciples right before he exits. You know the text, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go. Yeah. You see, I knew you knew it. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. My cousin's funny. <laughs> Thank God I didn't see you, man. Give God for my cousin in the house. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Go over here and take a picture of you. Yeah, yeah. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Philip said, have I been so long time with you? Philip said, show us the Father, and it, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you, and you still don't know that I and my Father are one? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, for I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. My God, that's some good stuff. We're going to start at the 16th verse. I was up above it, but we're going to go to 16, and we're going to read it out in the Amplified Bible, because the Amplified Bible does just that. It amplifies the text so that you can see that the particular words that are invested in the text have variances of meaning that you might get a deeper, richer, and fuller experience as you go into the Word of God. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verse 16. When you have it, say amen. amen. 
you can't find it, say pray for me. <laughs> Don't fake it. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, stand by. Good God of mercy. You going to let me have a comforter, a helper, an advocate, an intercessor, a counselor, a strengthener, a standby to be with you forever. Let's go on. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive and take it and take to its heart because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he, the Holy Spirit, remains with you continually and will be where? Will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I want to read that again. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I will come back to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will. You will see me because I live. You will live also. On that day, when that time comes, you will know for yourselves that I am in my Father and ye are in me and I am in you. Come on. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. No shenanigans, no slipping, sliding, ducking, hiding, night riding, but the one who keeps my commandments and really keeps them is the one who really loves me and whoever really loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. I will make myself real. Jesus is real to me. So many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. Jesus is real to me. I will make myself, I will make myself real to him. Come on. Judas, not his chariot, asked him, Lord, what has happened that you are going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone really loves me, he will keep my word, my teachings, and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. Ooh, ain't that something that God says, I and my father, we will come together and make our dwelling place with him. Do you know God lives with you? One who does not really love me does not keep my words. And the words, the teaching which you hear is not mine, but it's the Father's who sent me. I have told you these things while I am still with you. But the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me in my place, to represent in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. Peace, I leave with you. I felt anxiety leave out the room when I said that. Peace, I leave with you. My perfect peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. 
Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. Good God Almighty. You can go home now. <laughs> That's the sermon all by itself. What fascinated me about the text is that when it said that Jesus said, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, and helpless. I will come back to you. He's setting us up for the advent of the Holy Spirit to take up residence in the world, our advocate, our helper, our standby. And this morning I'm going to call him the guardian. My subject is the guardian. Eternal and all wise God, we come before you now, humble as we know how, asking you to sanctify the word in our hearts. Let the word bring forth fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, I'm home. First time I used this text publicly, I was 19 years old, preaching a funeral for a 17-year-old boy who was killed in a car wreck. I brought the family in, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also. And any time we associate a text with a circumstance, sometimes we compromise the context from which the text is taken because our point of reference is limited to homegoing services and funerals. But in actuality, this is not a text of bereavement. This is not a text that is meant to comfort people in times of emotional chaos and distress. This is a text that is given to explain to a nervous and restless group of disciples the feeling of abandonment that they are facing. The time has come in their life for Christ to step away in his physical form and they are being weaned from him much like many of the soldiers who go off to war and they kiss their kids and their wives goodbye and say, let not your heart be troubled. I will come back to you. It is the promise that he gives on his exit that they are not abandoned, but that he will give them a guardian, another comforter, an allos Pericletes, one who stands alongside to help and to aid and to give comfort. He is there to make sure that you don't suffer in my physical absence. He is there and has been with you and shall be in you. It was interesting to note that one of the fullest classes that we had on Wednesday night has been on the Holy Spirit itself. Because we want to activate the Holy Spirit, we want to know that he is more than goose pimples and chill bumps, but that he is a resident force in our lives. He's not a feeling in our lives. He is a force in our lives. He is not an emotion. He is the personality of God revealed through human bodies. He is the light that lights the lantern. We are the lantern, but he is the light. I was looking at the moon last night. It was a quarter moon out, and it was just glowing so beautifully in the night. And I said to a friend of mine, I said, the moon has no light of its own. It has no light of its own. It is at the mercy of its ability to see the sun. And to the degree to which it sees the sun, it illuminates in direct proportion 
to that visibility that it experiences with the sun. The only reason it is only lit to a quarter is because of the obscurity of the vision. So the clearer the vision, the brighter the light. So you might have some half moon Christian right now that are gonna get a vision that's gonna take them to half moon that takes them to, oh, uh, y'all don't, don't get it, to, to, to full moon if you keep walking with him. So the moon is just a reflection of the sun in another part of the world. And that's what we are to be created in his image, a mirror, a reflection of his glory. There are many things, and one of them we're going to talk about today is a reflection of his glory. What's going to help us to understand is that this is an allegory in its essence as a story or a picture or a piece of art that uses symbols to convey a hidden or ulterior meaning, typically a moral or political one. This is an allegory. In other words, it's, I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I'm saying that it has a double meaning. In its most simple and concise definition, an allegory is when a piece or visual or narrative media uses one thing to stand in for a different hidden idea. The reason that the idea is hidden from us is that what Jesus is saying is consistent to what the bridegroom would say to the bride, okay? Because in Jesus' day, they took marriage a little differently than we do today. At the time you were engaged, you were actually married, even though the marriage hadn't been consummated. That time period, you had entered into an agreement that was serious and committed. That's why Joseph was going to give Mary a bill of divorcement, though he had not yet married her, he had betrothed her. He had entered into commitment with her, and that was a part of the marriage ceremony. What Jesus is saying to the disciples has the reflection and the relevance of what marriage meant in the Bible days. Can I go deeper? Marriage mimics the gospel. It is a shadow of how God brings us into the commonwealth of Israel. In its purest form, marriage is adoption. Marriage is adoption. When I met my wife, she was Sarita Jameson. But when I married her, I gave her my last name and adopted her into the Jake's family. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You in? Yeah, after 43 years, if it didn't take by now, it's not going to take. <laughs> the whole theme of weddings are important to God. Marriage is important to God. It means a lot to God. Your marriage is important to God, but marriage in general as an institution is important to God because it mimics his relationship with us not your marriage. Marriage itself <laughs> mimics his relationship with us. The church is often called the bride of Christ for that reason. All throughout the Bible, God talks about marriage over and over again. From the book of Genesis, where he begins, uh, the very first thing he does before he establishes the church before he establishes the community, he starts with marriage. He puts Adam into a deep sleep, pulls a rib out of his side and makes Eve to be his bride and performs the first marriage in the book of Genesis. From the book of Genesis to the book of Revelations, where we had the marriage supper of the Lamb, the whole Bible is full of inferences and references to marriage. In the second chapter of John, it opens with the marriage at Cana. So we see marriage in Genesis. We see marriage in Revelations. We see marriage in the Gospel of St. John. We see it over and over again. We see references to marriage. He tells one prophet to go and marry a harlot. It is not so much 
that he wants the prophet to be married to the prostitute, but he is trying to show us an image, an allegory of what he is going through being married to his people. Maybe your marriage he is using as an allegory to show you what it feels like for him to be married to us. I told you they wasn't gonna like this message. So the second chapter of John opens with Jesus at the marriage at Cana. In the times of Christ, a Jewish wedding was a joyous and important event that typically lasted for several days. Days, I don't know how they afforded it. We did it in one day and I almost went broke. The wedding was typically held in a couple's home or in a rented space or in a banquet hall or a palace. The day of the wedding was considered a holiday and many friends and people would come to celebrate this particular uh, magnanimous occasion. The wedding started with the betrothal, which was a simple ceremony where the couple would pledge to marry each other. It started way back then. Some marriages took longer than others. After the betrothal, the couple would wait for a few months or even years for the wedding to take place. During this time, the couple would prepare for the wedding and not just the couple, but the bridegroom would go and build a house for his wife because he understood that it was his responsibility to provide. So I want to be sure you get this. So he engaged her, but he says, I can't marry you. I have to go prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And so Jesus is speaking in language that is familiar to the Jewish people. He's speaking groom talk. He's speaking groom talk. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so, but none of them are suitable for you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Hallelujah, that this, this is marriage talk. This is wedding talk. This is what the wedding ceremony is symbolic of. When we say that the wedding is sacred, it's not sacred because Jimmy and Susie are standing there because Jimmy might not be sacred and Susie might not be sacred either. But the, 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 they could be, I'm not taking anything away from them. But the institution itself is an icon and an allegory of a relationship that has a much deeper meaning than what society is talking about today. This is not a sociological or a political issue. From the text, it is a theological issue. It always was and it always will be because marriage is a picture of the relationship that God has with us in that he has adopted us and given us his name. Did he, did he not say, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, that will I do? Did he not say, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus? He's given us his name as a sign of betrothal, of adoption. I will not leave you orphaned. I will not leave you doubting who you are. I will not leave you at the mercy of anybody else accepting you in order for you to be whole. I will come to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? On the day of the wedding, the bride and the groom would start their day with the church service, followed by a procession to a wedding ceremony. They would go through all of these routines. The wedding ceremony typically took place in a synagogue and it was led by a rabbi. During the ceremony, the bride and groom would exchange vows and make promises to each other, make promises to each other. No wonder we have precious promises. He made promises to us like any groom would make to his bride. Precious promises have been extended to you. And the good thing about his promise, he always keeps his promises. He said, I'm not a man that I should lie or the son of man that I should repent. 
Have I not spoken it? Shall I not perform it? Have I not said it? Will I not make it good? After the wedding ceremony, there would be a grand feast, which was attended by the family and the friends and the members of the community. The feast typically lasted for several days. That's why you hear the book of Revelations talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is a celebration of after the wedding has taken place, we go into the marriage supper of the Lamb. In fact, on, cro on the cross, Jesus was giving his body to his bride. Oh, you're going to get with me in a minute. On the cross, he was giving his body to the bride. In the resurrection, the bride will give her body to, to him, and we will enter into the merry supper of the Lamb. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead and Mary saw him out in the garden and she called him Rabboni and he said, touch me not for I have not yet ascended to my father. What he means by that is I've got to put the blood on the mercy seat. I've got to sanctify a place for you. I've got to consecrate a, a place for you that where I am, there ye, be, there ye may be also. So don't contaminate my blood with your touch because I'm on a mission. I've made a promise that I've got to go to prepare a place for you. I did not rise from the dead just to prove to you that I am Lord. I rose from the dead so that my perfect, holy, spotless blood could hit the mercy seat and prepare a place for you to be able to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So all the friends and the family would gather around for the supper that came at the end. It was a celebration of love, of the commitment of the bride and groom. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So the Jewish wedding took quite some time to take place. That's where you get the parable about the five wise and the five foolish virgins who kept their oil lamps trimmed and burning waiting for the bridegroom cometh because no man knew the day nor the hour that the bridegroom would come back. They knew he was coming back. They knew he had promised to come back. They knew he had betrothed us. They knew that he had declared to us that we were his. They didn't know how long it would take him to prepare a place, but we were supposed to keep our lamps trimmed and burning for we did not know what day the master would come back for us. And this is why the Holy Spirit is so important to us because keeping your lamps trimmed and burning is an indication of having oil in your lamp. Oil in your lamp is keeping yourself ready so that whenever he comes, if he comes before I get through preaching, if he comes before I close the service, if he comes before you leave the parking lot, if he comes in a suddenly, in a immediately, if he comes in a flash, we'll be ready because we have the oil of the Holy Spirit down inside of us, which is a guardian that lights the way so that we can see the Father. Philip says, show us the Father and it suffices us. Jesus said, have I been so long time with you and you still don't know that I and my Father are one? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. So here I go with my light, which is coming from my oil because I have the guardian down inside of me and I can see him. And Philip said, it, how can we go? We don't know the way. We've never been there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. And all of the Bible over and over again, there is an emphasis on marriage. Jacob worked seven years that he might have Rachel, and instead he gets her sister, Leah, and has to work another 14 years before he gets Rachel, the love of his life. It took a long time, but he came back for 
her. We see it over and over again, the importance of marriage in the scriptures is symbolic of a much bigger issue. I am not saying that your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. I'm saying the institution, the ideology, the concept of marriage itself is a picture of Christ and the church. That did he not say in the Old Testament, I'm married to the backslider. Yeah, you threw him out of the church, but I'm still married to the backslider. That, that, that's why I told the prophet to go marry a prostitute and I let him go redeem her off the slave table because that's what I did with you. I promised you and you went a whoring and had strange children, but I still want you. And if I have to buy you back, that's what redemption means to buy you back. I bought you back off the slave table. You embarrassed me, but I still bought you. You, you, you made me ashamed, but I still brought you. You scandalized my love, but I still brought you. You took my promises for granted, but I still bought you. And if I have to go down to the slave auction and see you standing there butt naked on the table, you're still my wife. Your hair is all over your head. Your makeup is smudged, but you're still my wife. And I will pay the price that is necessary to redeem you unto myself. Notice it is not redemption, it is redemption. I will buy you back. I will pull you out of your mess. I will pull you out of your shame. I will pull you out of your disgrace. I will pull you out of your trouble. I will pull you out. I will snatch you out because you're still mine. Shake your head and say, I'm still his. I messed up, but I'm still his. I blew it, but I'm still his. I haven't been steadfast, but I'm still his. He says, I am married to the backslider. So what Jesus is doing in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of St. John is talking to us like a groom talks to his, 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 his spouse, fiance. He said, don't, don't be upset. I know you're in love with me. He said, I'm going away for a little bit, but, 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 but I'm coming back to receive you unto myself. We ain't finished. We, we're just getting started. And, and while I am gone, and while I am gone, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will not leave you in this world by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to deal with witches by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to deal with devils by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to face diseases by yourself. I will not leave you in this world to have to fend for yourself. I will leave you an advocate, a comforter, a standby. I will leave you somebody, a guardian that stands in for you until I return again. You are protected, you are covered, you are sealed, you are connected. He is in you, glory to God. He is inside of you, protecting you. You might not always sense him, but the devil knows that you're anointed. The devil already knows that there's oil in your lamp. The devil already knows that there's glory down inside of you. Did not the Bible say, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? That means that the devil can, can really detect when you have had an encounter with God. There are certain things he can't do to you because you're covered by the blood. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So the Bible said that when the sons of God came around the throne along with them also came Satan and Jesus and God asked him, where have you been? He said, I've been going to and fro and up and down seeking, watch this, whom I may devour. If you got to seek who you can, then there's got to be somebody who you can devour. The reason you're still here is because he couldn't devour you. The reason you made it through your test 
is because he couldn't devour you. The reason he didn't take you out is because he couldn't devour you. The devil can only devour some people. A thousand may fall at your right side. 10,000 will fall at your left side, but it will not come nigh you because I've got a guardian around you. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So, so Satan, otherwise known as Lucifer, says, I've been going to and fro, up and down throughout the earth, seeking whom I may devour. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, come on, please. You know I can't do nothing with him. You got the guardian around him. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You've got a hedge all around him. You've got protection all around him. I can't even get to him. I can't get to his property. I can't get to his children. I can't get to his body. I can't get to his mind. I can't get to his emotions. Because you've got you've got that force field around him. You've got that protection around him. You've got that courage. That's why you didn't die of crib death. That's why you didn't die at an early age. That's why you made it through three trimesters. That's why you made it through adolescence and puberty. Because God had a guardian around you. You were not orphaned in this world. You were not alone in this world. You were protected in this world. I need about a thousand protected people that will... Touch somebody and tell them I've been protected all my life. I may have gone through trouble, but trouble didn't go through me. I may have had a hard time, but it didn't prevail over me. I've been protected all my life. When the enemy came in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord lifted up a standard against it. I've been protected all of my life. I never had to fight for myself because the battle was not mine. It belonged to God. And every time they thought they had me surrounded, I looked again and I was surrounded by him. I've been covered on the right. I've been covered on the left. I've been covered on the north. I've been covered on the south. I've been covered while I was sleeping. I was covered even when I was wrong. I was covered when I made mistakes. I was covered in my foolishness. So when you see me praising God, don't think I'm praising God because I'm crazy. I'm praising God because I'm protected. I want somebody to take 30 seconds and just forget the just, 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 just. Not only has he covered me, he's covering me right now. Touch your neighbor and say, God's got you covered. Whatever you're worried about, God's got you covered. Whatever is getting on your nerves, God's got you covered. Whatever the devil is threatening you with, God's got you covered. Hallelujah. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, will in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the... That I may dwell in the... That I may dwell in the... That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me he shall set me upon a rock and now shall my head be 
lifted up above my enemies and I will sing, I will sing praise under my God. Somebody sing a praise to your God right now. The Bible says that Herod's daughter danced before the king, and the king said, if you dance before me, you can have whatever you want. And she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist lost his head because that daughter found her dance. Let me tell you something. If you dance before the king, he will cut the head off of your enemy. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises against you, God will condemn. I know you're quiet. I know you're conservative. I know you're reserved. I know you're intelligent. But when you're in a fight with the devil, sometimes you got to dance for his head. You got to dance for a breakthrough. You got to dance for deliverance. I'm going to take 30 seconds for a praise drink. Because there might be something you want to kill. There might be something you want to annihilate. There might be something you want to destroy. There might be something you want to take out. There might be something you want to get out of your way. There might be something that you want to annihilate. And I dare you to dance before the king. I feel it, 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 I feel it,
I feel somebody, the devil's been trying to tell you you are an orphan, but the devil is a lie. God said, I will not leave you an orphan. Hallelujah. I will send an alos paracletus, one who stands alongside to help. One who stands alongside to help, like God parents do with parents at baby dedications. They stand alongside to help. They have a responsibility that if something would happen to the parents, the guardians step in to make sure that the decisions for the child are taken care of. Like the executive over a will or an estate, they step in as a guardian to make sure that the will is taken care of according to the testator who left a will for the children, the executor over the will is there to make sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get. The Holy Ghost is there to make sure that everybody gets what they're supposed Praise to them. get. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your stuff. You don't have to worry this about nobody getting little, your yes, life. Just, you don't have yeah. to worry about nobody getting your job. You don't have to worry about nobody getting your blessing because the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost is the executive over the estate. And whatever the testator has will for you to get, you're going to get it. Can I get a good hand clap for the testator? So now I'm going to go further. Jesus' conversation was so real to the apostles that they were expecting his return at any moment. When they stoned Stephen, the Bible said that Stephen, while they were stoning him in his face, he wasn't looking at the rocks, but he looked up into the heavens and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. And once he saw Jesus, the rocks didn't make any difference at all because he remembered that he had a promise from the Lord. Anybody, you got some rocks thrown at you right now, but you got a promise from the Lord. Look above the rocks and see that God is still with you. Does somebody say he's still with me? You hit me, but he's still with me. You talking about me, but he's still with me. You scandalizing me, but he's still with me. You don't like me, but he's still with me. You crash me, but he's still with me. Shout yes! The last days were so paramount in the mind of the disciples that when, when Peter started preaching on the day of Pentecost, he reminded them, he said, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke of, that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see this. This is that which the prophet Joel spoke of in the last days. The last days started then. You up here talking about we're in the last days. We're not in the last days. We're in the last seconds. The apostle Paul, who was a new convert who had been uh, a follower of Judaism all his life, a Hebrew and zealous concerning the law when he was converted on the road to Damascus. The very first book he wrote was the book of Thessalonians. So don't read Paul's writings in the order that they are in your Bible. The first writing of Paul came from Thessalonians. And he says, he says that day will appear but not before the man of sin is revealed because all Paul knew is that the groom was coming back. It was years before he understood the death, burial, and resurrection. It was years before he understood justification by faith. It was years before he understood the fruit of the Spirit. It was years before he understood the gifts of the Spirit. But while he was still in Corinth, 
trying to establish a church, he wrote Thessalonians because the one thing he was sure of is that he was coming back. The guardian had not yet reminded him of all that Jesus taught. So as Paul's understanding increases, his epistles increase. But the one thing he understood from the beginning is that he's coming back again. Tell somebody and say he's coming back again. He's coming back again. He's coming back. You, you'd be surprised how differently people would live if they really believed he was coming back again. You'd be surprised at the habits you say you can't quit, that you would quit if you believed that Jesus was coming back again. You'd be surprised at the people you wouldn't cuss out if you believed that Jesus was coming back again. You'd be surprised the people you wouldn't do evil to if you really believed that Jesus was coming back. Because the Bible said, if you really believe what I said, you will keep my commandments. Not, not you will dance, not you will shout, not you will holler, but the sign that you really believe me and that you really love me is that you obey me. Oh, I lost you. Let me try you. Obedience is a sign of love. Obedience is a sign of love. Obedience is a sign of love. So that's why obey him is in the vow. It's not because he's smarter than you. It's because your marriage is playing a role. And the bride is the church. And as the bride, the Bible, include, we include the word obey into it because obedience is a sign of love. It's not that you're any lesser. It's not who makes the most money. It's not anything that society is talking about today. That's why the text said that society cannot see me. You're trying to make the culture see the Christ. The culture can't see the Christ. The culture only sees what's fair, what's right, according to the norms of the times that you're living in. But this is not about you and Harry. This is not about you and Boo Boo. This is not about you and Frankie. This, this, you're, you're just an icon. You're just a, a symbol. The union is a symbol of a far deep principle and an allegory that has way more strength in it than your personality does with his. This is not about you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself a ransom for it. Can I preach this thing this morning? 
So God establishes the, the marriage yes, sir. as a prophecy that has meaning behind it because it is symbolic of Christ and the church. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there ye may be also. Whether ye go, you do not know, but I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. Jesus is talking language that they understood. He's talking marriage talk. The reason it sounds like funeral talk is that we are in a different culture. So we bring bodies in saying, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place. We don't even know what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is the promise of the betrothed. Christ to the church. What we're really talking about is the dilemma Joseph was in. Because before he could build the house, Mary got pregnant. And he said, let me give her a bill of divorcement privately to put her away. Because had he finished the house, she wouldn't have had Jesus in a barn. He didn't have a prepared place for her. So she rode on a donkey. I feel like preaching this morning. She rode on a donkey. Because everything was going down so fast. And said, he said, well, maybe I should divorce her. But, but the angel said, don't divorce her. That that is in Mary was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And it put him in a dilemma because he hadn't prepared a place for her. So he said, he, he said, as a guardian, I'm going to have to put you in the inn. But there was no room at the inn. So she had the baby in the barn. But because God is sovereign, he, he meant for her to have the baby in the barn. Because she didn't really have a baby. Because babies aren't born in barns. She had a lamb. Come on. Come on with me. Come on with me, church. 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 Come on with me. Come on. Come on. Do you know God's got a place for you? God's got a prepared place for you that you are not in this world by yourself. Holler at me. Now behold the land, the precious land of God. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, oh, she's in delivery. Oh, oh. And the raptor in swaddling clothes. And he was born in a manger while shepherds were outside tending the flock. They were tending a lamb, but she was having the precious lamb, the precious lamb, the precious lamb, the precious lamb. Come on, come on, come on, come on. The precious Oh! That's what I'm telling you. Anybody glad you came to church this morning? 
I remember when I used to have to go out and speak a lot. I was going all the time and my kids were real small and they never liked for me to go preach, you know. And they, they felt like I was leaving them. They didn't understand I was taking care of them, but they, they felt like I was leaving them. They grabbed my legs and said, Daddy, don't go. Daddy, don't go. I had suitcases at the door. Daddy, don't go. I said, I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. But I left you with your mother. I didn't leave you by yourself. I left you with your mother. You're in good hands. And this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He said, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. You're not going to be without a guardian. You're not going to be without a protector. You're not without somebody who's going to feed you. You're not without somebody who won't fight for you. You're not without somebody who won't take care of you. But Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Can I go deeper with this thing? Do you not realize that the Holy Spirit is your guardian? protecting you in the weight that the anointing of God in your life is there to protect you in the weight so that people can get a lock of your hair and can't curse you so that they can make a doll that looks like you stick pins in it but you can't feel it because you got the Holy Ghost because you got the Holy Ghost down on the inside you are still here some of you are the only one in your family that survived but because of the Holy Ghost you are still here the disease that runs through your family ran into a wall when it ran into the guardian that's standing up to protect you from all hurt, harm, or danger. Touch seven people and say, I'm protected. I'm protected. I'm protected. God's got me covered. I am protected. You ought to put AD. You ought to put ABT on your shirt and let hell know this house is protected. Don't try to burglarize me because God has got me protected. I wish I had a thousand people with the Holy Ghost in this place that would thank God for the guardian that you have over your life. The only reason you're not turning tricks is that the guardian kept you when you wouldn't keep yourself. The only reason you don't have a needle in your arm is because a guardian protected you when you wouldn't protect yourself. Say again. Yeah. The Holy Ghost. sticking. That yeah, mine is stuck too. Yeah, you just got to give it a second to. It's, it's like the app lags for a minute. Just give it a second. Okay. Pick up. You need him to protect you. You need him to guide you. You need him to be a fence all around you. You need him to be by your side. You need him to make a way out of nowhere. Somebody ought to thank him for the Holy Ghost. My guardian, my advocate, my comforter, my stand-alone side, my help. Talking about the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is on you now. Both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. I know there are a few witches in here, but I'm not scared of you. Because I got a guardian angel. And because I have a guardian, I, I, I understand that my root is stronger than your root. That I got more power in the hem of my garment than you have in your pocketbook. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit of God is all over me. And he's keeping me alive. Slap somebody and say the guardian did it. 
The guardian bless me with my house. The guardian bless me with my car. The guardian bless me with my life. He's just that good. He makes a way for me. He prepares a place for me. He opens doors for me. He provides for me. He protects me. When the serpent tries to bite me, it's the oil that drives the serpent away from me. I'm covered by the oil of God. Somebody shout yes. When I was in Jerusalem, I talked to an old shepherd, and the shepherd told me that the sheep are so dumb that they'll stick their nose in the holes, and the holes in the ground are where the snakes live. But a good shepherd will take oil and put it on the sheep's head. I said, why do you put oil on the sheep's head? He said, because the oil is a snake repellent. Think of all the things you stuck your head into. But because the oil was on your head, I heard David say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He covers my head with oil. You tried to kill me, but I shook it off because I got oil on me. I got snake repellent. Look at your neighbor and say, what are you wearing? Tell them I'm wearing snake repellent. I'm covered with oil. This is not Chanel. This is not Tom Ford. I'm covered with oil of the lamb. I've got a guardian protected me both day and night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul should keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul will take. He kept me when I was asleep. He kept me when I was under anesthesia. He kept me in the operating room. He kept me in the car wreck. He kept me when my friends were enemies. He kept me when I was surrounded by witches. He kept me when the enemy tried to destroy me. He kept me down through the years. The guardian has made a way for me. The guardian has opened doors for me. The guardian has protected me. I wish I had a hundred people that had the Holy Ghost. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. If you don't like me, I'll be okay. Because he tells me I'm his own. I'm not an orphan. I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. If you think you got me cornered, the devil is a lie. Hallelujah. God has me surrounded. He's got me covered. He's got me protected. He's got me covered on every side. Hallelujah to God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I gotta quit, but I feel the power of the Holy Ghost all over this place. He's real. He's real. Jesus is real. So many people died. But I
the guardian was sitting right beside me. If you thought I was eating by myself, you're wrong. The guardian is sitting at the table. Peter Somebody tell him the guardian did it. Ain't no need and hate no me. The guardian did it. The guardian gave it to me. The guardian protected me. The guardian surrounded me. The guardian guided me. The guardian brought me through the storms, through the rain, through the lightning, through the flood. He's always been there. Every time I turn around, God keeps doing great things for me. Somebody turn around right fast. He's my king. He's my prince. He's my peace. He's my redeemer. He's my day star. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's my trumpet. He's my lily in the valley. He's my bright and morning star. He's my king and redeemer. He's my bulwark. He's my water in dry places. Yes, he is. 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 show you something close. Ephesians chapter 5. Put it up there for me. Give it to you. Woo! Ephesians 5. Find it for me. Uh -huh. I didn't give it to you. But I still know it. Yes, sir. Ephesians 5. We talks about wives obey your husbands. You got it? Yeah. Going down. Pull them on and out too. Keep on going. Uh huh. Keep on going. Uh huh. Uh huh. Keep going. Uh huh. Keep going. Uh huh. Uh huh. You're right there. Five twenty-one. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not of, not out of who's right or wrong out of reverence for Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Come on. 
Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourself. Not to men. To your own husband as a service to the Lord. I know that's not what you're reading in the magazines today, but that's what the word said. Come on, keep going. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. You, you supposed to see her as your body. Let me show you something, hold it right there, I'm gonna get the rest of it in a minute. When Adam woke up out of his sleep, before he saw Eve as his wife, he saw her as his body. He said, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So she is both the body of Adam and the bride of Adam. So when the Bible says that for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church himself, the savior of his body, why are you beating on your body? I never to this day have met a man who beat his woman and loved himself. The reason you are beating on her is that you don't like you. She is your body. She is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. Come on, I'm going to drive this home. As the church is subject to Christ, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Everything. As the Christ is subject to the church. Now, neither one of us got it real right. Because the church isn't always subject. And the wife isn't submissive. But the role you play does not, does not make you lesser than. But your role is an allegory of Christ and the church. So we're in our parents' closet and we're playing dress up. And, and you acted, you didn't put on the church and he has put on Christ and we're acting as the church has loved and submitted to Christ. That's what it's supposed to be. I'm not talking about what it is. Husbands love your wives. As Christ, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I just gotta be me. I just gotta be me, man. I just gotta be me. She don't understand me. She don't understand where I come from. It's how I am. So it's wrong. It's, it's I. You're supposed to do it as, not I. Christ has loved us here, so that he might sanctify her. So he, he, he's got to love her like that while she's still not sanctified. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Watch this. That he might present the church 
to himself that where I am you may be also in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and faultless if I had time I, I'd get into this some of her purity is your responsibility A lot of her anger is coming from the fact she has not been loved as Christ has loved the church. How can you submit to somebody who won't be ahead? I'm just saying if you decide to do it the way the Bible said do it, if you decide to do it the way they're doing it now, I can't teach on that. I don't understand that. They're doing something new. I don't, I don't get it. Even so, husbands should love their wives as being, in a sense, their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Ladies, stop marrying men who don't love themselves. Because if he don't love him, he ain't loving you. Stand back. for no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it as, see where it keeps going back to? Yeah as Christ does the church. See, so, so I'm kind of confused because it sounds like he's talking about marriage, but I'm not sure because he keeps going back to as Christ does the church. Come on, give me some more of it. Because we are members, parts of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, oh yeah, they're talking about marriage, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Come on. This mystery, underline that, this mystery is very great. But I speak concerning the relation of Christ in the church. He's not even talking about marriage. He's only using marriage as a metaphor yeah. to talk about Christ and the church. However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife. He said, however, it's still good for you. Love his wife as being, in a sense, his very own self, and let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband that she notices him. This is all you got to do. This is all you got to do. Notice him. Regard him. Honor him. Prefer him. Venerate and esteem him. That she defers to him. Praises him and loves and admires him. Exceedingly. Now you gotta understand this. He says, I'm really not talking about marriage. I'm talking about Christ in the church. But it's still good medicine for you to understand how it really works. But what I'm really teaching you is let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. 
ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I will not leave you as an orphan, comfortless. I want that to sink in. I will not leave you. The reason I want it to sink in is because so many of us feel so alone. I will not leave you as an orphan, comfortless. I will give you a guardian and an advocate, one who stands. stands alongside to help you. If you've been in a hard place and you've been trying to do it in your own strength, you don't fail at it. Let me tell you something, sisters. I'm talking about I'm a strong one. I'm tough. I don't take no stuff. I wish you. Being strong is overrated. It might be all right for about 10 days or something like that. But you get in about 10 years of having to go to the grocery store, argue with the mechanic, carry the groceries up the steps, cook the food, help the kids with homework, drive them to school, go to job. Every dollar coming in the house, you got to bring it. Every napkin coming in the house, you got to buy it. Every piece of bread coming in the house, you got to buy it. It's, it's overrated. Brother, you can't be no man by yourself. Half of you didn't have no example. Half of you didn't have a good example. Some of you had a good example, wouldn't listen to it. Now you're trying to play a role by yourself. Y'all going out to that church, you women going out to church, and then they in the chair, and then they the chair. You should beat her in the door. You're the one that has to prepare a place. You're the one that has to give a ransom for her. You're the one who's supposed to love, cherish, and nourish her. You're the one that's supposed to treat her like you treat your own body. You're not supposed to starve her of your attention and affection. Yeah, I'm starving her because she's starving me. Did that you might sanctify her. You're supposed to leave her with no excuse to disrespect you. I'm not excusing her. I'm saying you're not supposed to leave her with no excuse. Some of you gave her a license to cuss you. And then got mad when she used it. The point of the message is I'm not preaching about marriage. <laughs> I'm just like Ephesians. I'm like Paul. I'm preaching about Christ and the church and that all God is using marriage for 
is an allegory. Marriage in general, not yours. So don't write me anything about your anger. What about what about when Fred come in at three o'clock? I ain't talking about Fred. It's just an example. A shadow mimics motion, but shows no details. Earthly marriages motion and model, but do not detail nor fully reflect. We are only talking about shadows, allegories. What we are talking about. I guess, I don't know whether that priest used to do it for me. When my mother died, a long time ago, I'm okay now, but when she died, and my father had been dead, it occurred to me that never again would I be able to walk in somebody's house and just go in the refrigerator. Never again would I have anybody that no matter what I did stupid, they would open up the door and take me in. Never again would I have somebody that I could come to their house at 3 o'clock in the morning and my mama would swear she wasn't sleeping. No, I wasn't really asleep. You hungry? And I felt like an orphan, a 40-year-old orphan. And what really, really made me want to drive this in is that I suspect that some of you with and without parents with and without spouses, with and without people. Feel like you're in this world all by yourself. And you go to church, and maybe you even have the Holy Ghost, but you're not really letting him be a guardian. And you feel abandoned. Orphan. And you feel like this is the test. If people really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. So you don't get the benefit of fellowship because fellowship is hidership. You've hidden like torpedoes buried in the bottom of an ocean dust and dirt all over top of you. And the guardian is standing there with his arms outstretched. Saying, come unto me all that are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy. And my burdens are light. And I know you got your image to protect your ego needs to model. But if you let go of your ego and your image a minute and you've been fighting like an orphan in an orphanage, everybody the whole reason your temper is so bad you don't feel safe. And let me tell you something. Needing to feel safe is not feminine. Even men. Need to feel safe. Are you safe to love? Are you safe to take care of? I don't mind giving you a house as long as I know that if you watch me with me.
truth of the matter is, there are as many lonely married folks as there are single folks. Truth of the matter is, there are as many miserable rich folks as there are desperate poor folks. And the guardian just wants you to be real for a minute and come to this altar. I am not going to go out in that parking lot and get in that car alone. I don't care what you say. I am going to get in that car with an awareness that I have been adopted into the royal family and the commonwealth of Israel. And I belong somewhere. I belong somewhere. I fit somewhere. somewhere I fit somewhere he has a place for me and I've been trying to shove into all of these places and now I realize that the guardian has a place for me I don't have to spend the rest of my life in a barn neither did Jesus there's a place God had me preach this to let you know he heard you. This message is a prophetic sign that God heard you. That he's been watching over you, that he's been looking at you. the sound of marriage, you miss the whole point. This is about Christ and his scared, trembling, dirty, nervous little bride. The spots and wrinkles and such things. I'm going to wait about 50 seconds. Everybody that needs to be at this altar needs to be at this altar in 50 seconds. In 50 seconds. In 50 seconds. Everybody that needs to be at this altar needs to be at this altar in 30 seconds. Watching online, the Holy Spirit is in this place. The guardian. You're not alone. You might feel alone. You might have feelings of loneliness. But you are not alone. He said, I will not leave you as an orphan. You don't have to keep wishing you were somebody else. God will make you comfortable with being you. As for provision, he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will prepare a table before you. Mary never had to look for a place to stay. That was Joseph's job. Some of you, everything got done. You had to do it. And you just wore out. He said, I didn't leave you like that. I didn't leave you orphaned. You're not by yourself. I don't know the song, but from about 
God's got me surrounded. They all think I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. I'm going to get in a crevice that none of them books you read that got in. This is going to be a spirit thing. It's not going to be therapy. It's not going to be counseling. It's going to be the presence of the Holy Spirit that's going to be a guardian of you. It's going to make you lift your head up. It's going to change the way you walk. It's going to fix you. It's going to fix you. It's going to fix you. Anybody else? Before I pray, no secret agents. No secret agents. You will have to want this. You will have to come get this. You will have to be in convenience. He's not going to do house calls and make special arrangements because you don't want nobody to see you. Anybody else? Go at once. Go at twice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It may look like I'm surrounded. Yeah. Like I'm surrounded right now. I'm surrounded by you. Say it one time. Some oil on our nose. A 
anoint our head with oil. Let our cup run of hope. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for what you're pouring into your people, your sons and your daughters, your husbands and your wives and your single people, your married people and your senior people and your ailing people and your hurting people and your broken hearted people and your people who just got out of a relationship and your people who are in a relationship that they can't get to work and your people who are frustrated because they're outcasts in their own families. God, let the guardian get in the car. Let the guardian wrap his arms around them and let them lay their head back on the chest of the guardian. And just minister to them. Just, just, just minister to them. Just minister in this moment. Just minister to them. Just minister to them. Just minister to them. Holy Spirit comforter, paraclete, minister to them. You stand by to help. Bring help around this altar. Woo! Bring help online into that living room, into that house, into that kitchen. Bring help in. Bring help. Who here comes? Help. Help. Help, help coming in. Help come, help, help me with how to think. Help me with how to talk. Help me with how to respond. Help me how to be more like you. Help me to be more like you. Help me, Lord. 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 Father, I thank you that these people around the altar will never be the same again. I thank you that they will never be the same again. I thank you that they will never be the same. I thank you that they will never be the same. I thank you that they will never be the same. In the name of Jesus, they're going to walk different. They're going to talk different. They're going to live different. They're going to speak different. They're going to laugh. They're going to love. They're going to have peace. They're going to be whole. Thank you, Lord. They're surrounded by you. They're surrounded by you. They're surrounded by you. And they'll never be the same.
You say you love him. It's time to walk like him. And talk like him. If you're watching online, don't you dare click off of this screen. This prayer is coming right to you. Before you get in the car, before you beat everybody out the parking lot and run into God knows what, this prayer of covering is going to seal the deal over your life. It's going to seal the deal over what you've been struggling with. It's going to be the anointing that breaks the deal. It's going to be the thing that settles in your mind that you have a guardian and you will never, ever be alone again. And all of that pain that you've been carrying, all of that pain, I'm coming right to you, all of that pain that you've been carrying with nobody to talk to and nowhere to go. the living God, we thank you. Thank you for being our guardian. Thank you for being our comforter. Thank you for being our helper. Thank you for being our protection. Thank you for covering us when we didn't even know we needed covering. Thank you for standing by when we couldn't stand for ourselves. Thank you for pushing back the arrows and the weapons of the enemy. Thank you for covering us in your blood. Thank you for shielding us and keep your angels camped about us. Thank you, God, that we are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, that we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. Thank you, God, that you're preparing a place for us. Thank you that we are not affected by our enemies, but God, we are elevated in spite of of our enemies. I thank you that the fire didn't destroy us. I thank you that the battle didn't break us. I thank you that we rose above. Out of the ashes came the beauty of who you are. We thank you for your fire. We thank you for your power. But most importantly, God, we thank you for what you left us with. Your peace. We thank you for peace. Peace over our children. Peace over our marriage. Peace over our job. Peace over our house. Peace in the hospital. Peace in the Middle East. Peace, God, over the country. 